Hey everybody, it's Benny One, and I'm back at you with a movie review, and today we're starting the Hobbit movies, everybody. That is right, we are kicking it off with 2012's Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, everybody. That's right. So after the Lord of the Rings trilogy finished up in 2004 with the Return of the King, we get the Hobbit trilogy quite a few years later, actually. So, because it was 2004 and we jumped to 2012, everybody. So, a pretty big gap since the Lord of the Rings finished, everybody. So, this movie, once again, directed by Peter Jackson. Like I stated in the other reviews, he did direct all six of the Middle Earth movies. So, Martin Freeman plays Bilbo Baggins, everybody. The younger version of Bilbo Baggins. We do get to see the older version of Bilbo that was in the Lord of the Rings in the beginning of the movie also. Um, even Frodo. Frodo actually freaking was in the beginning of the movie too, which was kind of cool. I like that it, the opening like 10 to 15 minutes, we get the, we get like backstory told to us kind of like they did in the Lord of the Rings, except for I think they spend a little bit more time in this movie with the backstory because it is like the first 15 minutes of the movie. So we get to see events that happened in the Fellowship of the Ring in this first 15 minutes that we didn't get to see in Fellowship of the Ring, we, but because these were new scenes that he added into this one for The Hobbit. So that was kind of cool to get to see Bilbo and Frodo have these interactions with each other in um, their house and stuff. And I love how the movie sets up and starts off the Hobbit, like this first Hobbit movie, it literally shows Bilbo sitting on a bench outside of his house and Frodo is running off to go meet Gandalf when he's coming into the Shire at the very beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring. I love that that's where the Hobbit basically starts because then the, the camera pans back to Bilbo sitting on the bench and it's the younger Martin Freeman version of Bilbo smoking weed, pipe weed, because you know them Hobbits like to smoke their pipe weed. I love that. I love how it connects it to the Lord of the Rings movies. I thought that was a very cool touch that Peter Jackson did. So, Richard um, Armitag, um, he plays Thorin Oakenshield, everybody. Our main dwarf king leader character. Um, he's kind of a, I don't know, he's kind of a prick in these movies, I feel like, from time to time. Especially in the third one. <laughs> he turns into an asshole. Because um, there's a curse that affects him just like it did his grandfather. So, um, Ian McKelpin returns to play Gandalf the Grey, everybody. We get to see a lot more Gandalf the Grey in this trilogy than we did in the other one, obviously, because he was only in the first movie. But we, I feel like in this trilogy, we get to see Gandalf do a lot more cool things as Gandalf the Grey in this trilogy. So, I kind of like that. So, an Ian McKelpin... It was like he never left, even though this was eight years later. It was like he never left. Didn't miss a beat at all. And then Andy Serkis returns in this one to as Gollum, everybody. That is right. Which I think is one of the best parts of this movie is when Bilbo meets Gollum and gets the ring from him because Gollum drops the ring and Bilbo gets the ring. And we get to see how that all played out and stuff. I think it's one of the best parts of the movie. They do this, uh, like, guessing game thing. Because Bilbo's trying to get him to show him out of that cave. And they're doing this guessing game thing. And it's very tense at parts. Because you know Gollum is going to probably kill him or try to kill him. Especially when he finds out that his ring is missing. And he kind of puts two and two together and realizes that... Bilbo took the ring. <laughs> so, awesome sequence. And Gollum looks amazing in this movie because it was, it's 2012. He looked amazing in the Lord of the Rings movies, but damn, he looks almost completely real in this one. Like, the CG, the jump in CG technology just from the other movies to this one, like, he looks almost real life in this movie. So... So the basic gist of this story is, is that Gandalf approaches Bilbo and he tries to convince him to go on this adventure with these dwarves to go reclaim their kingdom under the mountain, Erebor, and there is a fire-breathing dragon that is down in the bottom parts of their kingdom in the gold and everything. Schmog, everybody. 
and he tries to convince him to come along and be their thief and that's pretty much the gist of the story they convince him they come to his house um all the dwarves like, like a couple show up at a time and then we basically spend the next hour of the movie with them talking and having exposition and having dinner a very crazy the dwarves have very interesting dinners i would love to sit down and have a dinner with the dwarves because they drink they're crazy they sing songs they're messy it it would be fun it would be a lot of fun having a dinner with the dwarves um but yeah that's like the whole first hour of the movie after we get that 15 minutes initial setup like that's pretty much the first hour of the movie. And that's the one thing about this movie is, is um, it's a lot of setup. I feel like this first one, even though I did enjoy it, it does have a lot of setup for the rest of this trilogy. And I guess if I could say one negative thing about it is, is it does kind of feel like they stretched the first movie out a little bit too much. Like maybe it shouldn't have been as long as it was. Because it's a lot of setup, a lot of character development, and there's a lot of cool like scenes where our characters interactions and sequences and stuff. And there is awesome action adventure stuff in the movie. I'm not saying there isn't, but from the Lord of the Rings movies and then the three Hobbit movies, this is the one that I feel like solely is like purely like a setup movie. And they and it stretches the story a little bit too much, and I feel like they could have made it a little shorter. But after saying that, it is awesome to be back in Middle Earth. Like after the eight year gap, after the Lord of the Rings ended, it was refreshing and just nice to be back in Middle Earth with this Hobbit movie. And that's the thing about the Hobbit movies aren't as good as the Lord of the Rings movies. Yes, I will say that. Um, and after re-watching them for the fourth or fifth time now, I, I still feel that way. This trilogy of movies is not as good as The Lord of the Rings. Um, and I don't know if it's because this is solely one book and they made a trilogy out of it. I'm happy they made a trilogy out of it because I feel like we do get a really good chunk of what the Hobbit novel was in these movies um but like i said i feel like this first movie they kind of stretched it out just a wee bit too much so but i did enjoy it i did enjoy the hobbit an unexpected journey it was awesome being back with some of our characters i mean because we get characters from the lord of the rings movies in this um lord elron freaking saruman is in this like Gollum. like we get characters from the lord of the rings that are in this because this took place before that 60 years actually before the lord of the rings kicked off and it, it i love how peter jackson really connects this movie to the lord of the rings movies like they did a really good job with that so i'm gonna give the hobbit an unexpected journey i'm gonna give this one probably three and a half lightsabers out of five lightsabers it's not my favorite hobbit movie but i still enjoy it it's a good watch and like i said it's good just to be back in middle earth with these characters so three and a half lightsabers out of five lightsabers everybody i appreciate you watching hope you guys enjoyed the review and i'll be catching you on the tube laters because i have spoken